Welcome to the Growing Gorillas podcast. I'm Kisa Davison. And I'm Travis Davison. And this podcast is all about parenting. The ups, the downs. The in-betweens. We have absolutely no idea what we're doing. But likely neither do you. So kick back, relax, and enjoy. Special thank you to the Cleared Hot podcast for use of the studio and Andy Stump for all of his invaluable information. If you'd like to learn more about Cleared Hot, visit clearedhotpodcast.com. Let's do this. Drink Element. LMNT is our podcast sponsor today. It's a healthy alternative to sugary electrolyte drinks. Every grab and go stick pack replaces all the essential electrolytes that you need with no sugar, no coloring, no artificial ingredients or any other junk. I drink Element every day and so does Travis to support- Because it's delicious. Well, I was gonna say, I drink it to support my hydration I would say my low carb diet, my fast, my workouts, et cetera, but none of those things are true. <laughs> I just drink it because it's good and I need water in the morning. My favorite flavor is definitely the orange one and the green one and the pink one. Yes, yeah, so you're saying raspberry, orange, and lime. Correct. Which I don't disagree with you on. However, the watermelon is delicious. And let's not forget the chili and lime is good with tequila as is the habanero mango, I think. The two spicy ones are really good with tequila. Not recommended in the morning, but still good with tequila. Well, yeah, and it's kind of like, I guess, counterbalances. Totally. I don't know. It's don't, a math equation. It works I don't, out somehow. I don't think Rob Wolf necessarily is going to stand behind that. I know, but he's not here, so. That's true. I'm the official on the subject. But listen, here's the cool part. As a member of our Growing Gorillas community, Element has a very, very, very cool offer for you. You can let um, let them know that you are interested in trying out a sample pack. All you have to do is cover the cost of shipping so you can get yours. Which is what, like five bucks? I don't know. I, I think don't. it's like five bucks. Anyways. I just charge things on my credit card. I don't look at it. Cheap. Cheap. So here's the URL. Drink lmnt.com slash growing gorillas. Now remember, growing gorillas, you have to spell all the way out and there's two G's right in the middle, so don't screw it up. Drinkelement.com slash growing gorillas. And in the words of Stella Davison, hydrate or dihydrate. I feel like Element should adopt that as their new tagline. Well, they just, they just did. Okay. <laughs> okay. You guys, this week... We have one of the most precious conversations ever with the one, the only, the sweetest, Nana. My card playing partner, my pinochle partner. The chef to beat all chefs. Yep, and really the, I mean, she is the matriarch of the family. She is, absolutely is. She is fierce, she is beautiful, she is smart, she is kind. All you had to say was she's a redhead. She is a redhead. Well, that covers everything you just said. <laughs> Nana's, I think, given name is Claire Bell. I don't even know. Oh, well, uh, Waltz. Waltz. Is her maiden name. And then her married name, Claire Bell Simons. Her but, nickname is Honey. Right, because I believe the story goes that she was born and the doctor pulled her out and said, oh, she's a honey. Uh, I think that was the story I was told. I just remember that my... Papa Joe used to sing, if you've got the money, honey, I've got the time. Papa Joe, good old Papa Joe. To us, she's known as Nana. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. She's doing the same thing she always does to me. What's, What's that? that? Picks my brain. Yeah. Uh, it's true. Well, I think um, smart people pick wise people's brains. That was a double compliment. One Thank for you. Lisa. Thank and, you. And one for you. Um, so this is your first podcast? Yes, it is. Okay, so... Kisa and I started this podcast as a way to help parents because there's not a lot of 
useful information out there. And I think parenting is probably one of the most important things that we do as human beings. Uh, it's really the only thing of importance that we leave behind. And it has a huge impact on the future, uh, obviously their children, their children's children. And so when we were making a list of people we'd like to have on the podcast, your name come up, you know, top of the list, you know, matriarch of <coughs> our family um, and 88 years of trial and error and, you know, ups and downs. And um, we thought it would be really helpful and, and useful, not just for Keith and I um, and also for, you know, our family, because now we'll have a recording that, you know, can go on in perpetuity. Um, but for other people out there who are, you know, maybe thinking about having kids or have kids or maybe grandkids. I mean, because you can come at this thing from having raised children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Are we on great-great-grandchildren now? Mm -hmm. So we're now up to great-great-grandchildren. So um, that was kind of the, the idea behind this. And it's really pretty simple. Basically just have a conversation and, and do exactly what you said. Um, let Kisa pick your brain some more. Mm -hmm. Okay, Kisa, you're on. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it was at least two years ago, Thanksgiving, that we did a count of how many are in the family. We were at 103. I think it's 105. 105. That's a lot of people. It might even be more, I'm trying to think, how many have been born in the last two years. Right. Okay, so... It's Make, a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> Over 100. And I feel like the audience should know that you send birthday cards to every single one of those people. When did you start sending out your birthday cards? Oh, my goodness. I think probably before I had any grandchildren. Started sending them to friends and family? Mm-hmm. And your kids and their spouses? Right. Well, I kind of cut out the spouses because <laughs> they kept rotating <laughs> it's too hard to exactly. keep up <laughs> and what I love about the cards is that but I didn't know this until I lived with you but what I loved is that she, Nana said that they get $10 up until they turn 18 and then she figures they're on their own high school graduation that's the cutoff college and then marriage. Right. So. And, but everybody always gets a Bible verse. Yep. Now, do you select that based on the person that you're sending the card to? I select it on what I feel God leads me to. I usually pray, see what God wants me to pray for them, and then usually I have a scripture comes. Does he ever tell you to pray for money for me? No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but you do all right anyway. Yeah. Well, you could give it a try. I it could. I could. Because <laughs> he can either say no. <laughs> <laughs> There's just Actually, you know what? crickets, dead silence. <laughs> Maybe you better not ask. Sometimes it's better to be careful what you ask for. That's true. But you know what it says? If you don't ask. Mm. That's true. So what was it like, because um, I mean, in 88 years, obviously you're gonna have lots and lots and lots of experiences and, and you've been through some pretty amazing historical events in your lifetime. Um, but one of the things I mentioned to Kisa this morning, we were getting ready uh, to come down here, that I've always thought was impressive and, and um, admirable um, is you, you have five children, and at age 30, which would have been 58 years ago, which, what year would have that been? That's too much math for me. Like in the 70s? Probably. You went back to nursing school, or went to nursing school for the first time? No, actually it was in the 60s, because I graduated in 68. From nursing school? Right. So... And I know Papa um, worked, you know, and had a business and obviously was busy, I would imagine. I, 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 you know, I wasn't even alive at that time. <clears throat> but I do remember him still going to work 
even as as a child uh, at the house. So I'm imagining that he's working at least 40 hours a week. Way more. Way more. Um, and then you're full-time nursing and then also raising five kids. So tell me how that worked. Well, I had raised my kids to um, contribute to the household. And, uh, you know, Jay had things he had to do in the yard, and he also learned to cook, which was good because his first wife couldn't boil water. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. Her name won't be mentioned, but I remember. And then um, the girls all learned to do uh, cooking household chores early on, and it was just a given. Mm-hmm. So they were pretty self-sufficient, and or did you, was there ever a time where you had to have like a daycare or babysitters or anything like that? Were they able to take care of themselves when you guys were? Well, when I was uh, going to nursing school, Tammy was the, the youngest, and she was, let's see, five or six. And my dad would come down about the time the kids were due home and he'd stay there until I got home, which was shortly after. And uh, it worked great because he loved it. Mm -hmm. what, was the, um, what was the societal pressure then as far as being a, um, a wife, a mother, and then was it, uh, were, did you feel supported by people like that you were going back to school, that you were gonna, you know, have a career, or was it something where people were, why would you do that? Or do you remember what that was like? Was it? Well, I think I had a little bit of both. Some thought, you know, that was just crazy. <clears throat> but most of the time I had support. Mm -hmm. How did Papa feel about it? He was always supportive. And he used to joke with me, he'd say, "Hun." I bought you books and sent you to school, and you still don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> but then he'd correct himself, and he'd say, no, you're a pretty smart cookie. Yeah. He was pretty lucky. You were too, but he was pretty I lucky. I was very lucky. So Tammy was five or six. That means who's next in line? Jay. Jay would have been seven or eight. Yeah, he's about two and a half years older. And then Debbie. Then Debbie. And she was the real house worker. She still is. I know. I have a stack of laundry that I need her to get coffee stains out of. <laughs> <laughs> no. And then Sue and then Linda. Right. So Linda, being the oldest, would have been how old? She was early high school? Oh, uh, let's see. That's a lot of yeah, math. Yeah, she was, yeah. My math brain isn't kicking on yet. And did they have activities that they were doing after school? I mean, back then, in the olden days, were there such thing as soccer leagues? Uh, yes, Jay was in baseball, and um, I don't know if at that time Debbie was still taking dance, mm -hmm. but uh, most of the time the kids were just involved in being kids, which I find is very lacking in today's society. I see some families where they don't even have dinner together because they've got a soccer game or a ball game, or and the kids are up at mm -hmm. 9 o'clock at night just starting their homework. Mm -hmm. I don't think they get enough sleep. That's why they're so ornery. <laughs> <laughs> sleep. Did you guys have dinner uh, together every night? Always. Yeah, I think that was really important. I remember that was kind of my dad's big thing. I, I remember we played a lot and stuff, and I think we had a chance to be kids and, <clears throat> and you know run around the neighborhood and play hide-and-seek and all that good stuff. But I remember if we saw his pickup truck in the driveway, it, it meant, you know. You better get home. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And then you were forced to talk about your day and what happened at school and I wanted to ask you the other day when we were talking, you said something, and I remember you said this when 
some of our COVID nights laying on the couch, <laughs> reminiscing. <laughs> <laughs> but you said when you were young, at some point you made it, you made a decision that when you became a mother, you would prepare breakfast every morning. Exactly. So what, talk to me about what, why and what you found. Well, when I was in grade school, my mom was sick a lot. <clears throat> and she didn't get up, and we did the best we could. To, I can't imagine what we might have looked at like sometimes, <laughs> but we got ourselves off to school, <clears throat> and I've never been a breast breakfast eater early because I never had breakfast early. Mm. And um, So you'd go to school without breakfast then? Correct. Okay, and so you decided, I'm going to make breakfast, and we... So the other day, well, Thursday, when I went over to Nan's before we played cards, we, we started that cookbook revision. And this was a section that wasn't in your original cookbook, which were the breakfast foods. So we went through all the different breakfast foods and waffle iron. Remind me, I need to bring that waffle iron to Nan. I was just going to say, I benefited from all those breakfasts as well. <laughs> you and had waffles. A lot of waffles. A lot of waffles, and I loved it. So between eating dinner as a family, making sure that you prepare breakfast as a family. It's becoming very clear to me how you became the end-all, be-all guru of all foods delicious in this family. And your mom didn't cook. No, she did very little, and it usually wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> so you learned what not to do, is what you're saying. But I've heard so many stories of the neighbors or friends that you had who you've picked up recipes for. So obviously preparing and serving food to your family as almost an act of love was important to you from an early age. It was. And still is. I forgot to bring Andy those. I have a few ginger snaps left I was going to share with Andy. Kisa had a late night uh, potato salad, thanks to you. I tried to hide it. Isn't in the that gone? Well, you would think all the good parts are gone, though. I've eaten all the pickles out of it and all the eggs out of it. And I went the... to have something the other day. It was just potatoes. It's just potatoes. <laughs> we might need a new batch. <laughs> that's what good I... luck. <laughs> well, that's what I tend to do whenever we get Nana's leftovers. I try to kind of squirrel them away in the back of the refrigerator, <laughs> hoping that no one sees the loaf of bread. It's hard to do with Ted in the house. I know. It is. There's nothing well. sacred. What, um, with five kids, what, um, were they the same? Was it different? Did you feel like you had to, was each kid handled individually or was there like a blanket one size fits all sort of approach to raising them? Or did you have to kind <clears> of, <throat> okay, this is Jay, so <clears throat> I better approach it this way. This is Linda. I got to approach her this way. Or this is Sue. I have to approach her this way. Or was it kind of, here's the rules. And everybody follows them. Well, here's the rules, but everybody didn't follow them. <laughs> and um, you, every child is unique. And you have to deal with them as individuals. And what I could do with Linda or uh, Debbie or even Tammy was way different than Sue or Jay. Because they were the bad ones? <laughs> no, they weren't bad. They were sometimes rebellious. Challenging. <laughs> Challenging. And, you know, I, I, I thought of a, a scripture that, that I really think. That's your phone. That's your phone. It's probably my mom. <laughs> or it's Aunt Sue. Someone's ears are burning. Well. It'll go to voicemail. Yeah, it will. You can talk over it. Yeah. Okay. I was thinking of a scripture this morning that's always been very important to me. And that's it's from Proverbs 22, 6. And it says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. And I've seen this lived out in my kids. I trained them up to be self-sufficient. I trained them up to be kind. I trained them up to be courteous, which I think is something really mm -hmm. lost in this generation. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, you don't have to send a child to kindergarten to learn to say please and thank you and excuse me. That should come from the home. So those are things that were just basic. And, of course, I didn't know the Bible at that time. But what I've learned since then, I was putting the biblical truths into practice, and God honors them. Hmm. So that's interesting because, you know, in addition to being, um, you know, like Kisa said, obviously the source of knowledge when it comes to cooking and food and eating, um, you're also looked to as kind of the spiritual leader of the family. And um, I guess I always took it for granted because when I was born and raised, you had already become that person. And I guess until just now, I didn't think about the fact that you actually parented all the kids through childhood into adulthood before you ever, you know, developed a relationship with God. Yeah. Well, in some ways, I think I had a relationship with him, but not really, um, Mm -hmm. because I'm a firm believer that our relationship with God comes from knowing him through the word. And once I began to see what was in God's word, I thought, wow, These are all truths that we all need to live by. And, you know, we've seen in our time the taking down of the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you were to ask most people what the Ten Commandments are, they probably could not tell you. Mm -hmm. And the first four commandments have to reverence to God. And then the sixth, the last six commandments is our reverence to one another and living in society in a way that we see has just been really crushed in these last years. Respect and courtesy. Yeah, and, and, uh-huh. and, yeah, and, and, and I, I think sometimes the, you know, the, the, the last six commandments uh, get thrown out because of the association with religion or God and uh, it's interesting because they're common sense right I don't Correct. think the I don't think the average human being would question any of them like they're not uh, <clears throat> thou shall not kill like I mean does anyone really yeah disagree with that I mean so that is it's interesting how they're stigmatized because they're not it's not some crazy ideas that don't make sense they make a lot of sense and allow us to behave and get along as a society, yeah. be productive and happy and yeah. to have that peace and joy that we're supposed to have on earth as in heaven. Well, the first one that God gave to us in regards to our relationships to other people was honor your father and your mother. And it's one commandment that has a promise that your days might be long. And I remember quoting that to my son one time, and I, <laughs> and I, I, and I said, you know what? Your days are getting shorter all the time. <laughs> I wish I would have had that one in my back pocket. That would have been uh, uh, come in handy a lot of times with our kids. Uh-huh. What, uh, uh, what is, or what was the difference you know, having because because now Keith and I are on the cusp of moving from being parents potentially at some point, and I'm not saying tomorrow, but at some point in the next few years, I would hope and imagine that we'll become grandparents. Maybe longer than a few years. I feel a little sick to my stomach when we talk about <laughs> a short time frame. What what? Um, I was only 38. Well, Ugh. that's young. That's young. And I thought we were young. I mean, we had all four kids before we were 30. I was 27 when Tammy was born. The last one. How old were you when Linda was born? 18, 19? 19. 19. Yeah. So what's the, um, compare being a grandparent to being a parent? Well, I think with parenting, you have more responsibility. Not that you don't with kids, 
of, you know, the next generation. Because I think we're all responsible for how we um, interact Mm -hmm. with kids because they learn from seeing us. And I know over the years I've seen a lot of kids that didn't get it from parents but got it from grandparents Mm -hmm. or older people. And so we're, we're all teaching whether we realize it or not. And, you know, I love words. I, I look up words. I look them up in the Hebrew and in the Greek and in the dictionary. And I love words. And I was thinking, you know, words are really important. They're very powerful. And we can speak words to our kids mm-hmm. that do a damage. Or we can speak words that will build them up and make them the people that they need to be as they grow up. And um, words are only words unless they're demonstrated. You know, people can say things, you know, say as I do, or say as I say and not as I do. And kids are always watching. So can you give some examples of how words can help and how words can damage? What kinds of words... Well, I have a younger sister that um, lives in Ohio, and when I went back there when her kids were still in school, and I think one of them was out of the house, but when I heard the way my sister and her husband talked to her kids, I said, you know what, you guys? The things that you're telling your kids that they are That's what's going to come home to roost. Mm. And did how did that did that come to fruition, or did they change? Oh, it did. No, and they had four kids. They all kind of fulfilled the prophecy. That's too bad. It is. Hmm. So, I mean, just to get down to the nitty gritties, child comes in and just is rebellious, shall we say that? (laughs) There's a rebellious child doing rebellious things. (laughs) The words to them aren't, um, you are this, or you are that, or you are not this, but what you did is not okay. Correct. As So instead of attacking their character or their person or their value as a human being, it's taking their action and making it separate from who they are. Is that? That is right on. Okay. You got that right. Yeah. Well, we've been talking a little bit about that, so. Mm-hmm. A lot about that. And you know, something that affected my life, my mom, love her, she's gone, and I miss her, but my mom didn't let things go. Hmm. If I did something wrong... The next time I did something, she would bring Mm. past history up. Mm -hmm. And that's a big no-no. Yeah, I've been learning that lesson myself. It's easy to do that, I think. Yeah. It's easy to hold grudges. It's it's easy to bring up old hurt, you know, and then, you know, new hurt comes and it's time to dig up the, the, the last time you hurt me kind of thing. And... And I think that's what Keith is talking about too. I can see how on, you know, a child that pretty soon they start to associate themselves with the thing and begin to then, okay, it's not that I made a mistake or I made a bad decision. This is now who I am. This, 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 this act now defines me and now I'm permanently stuck being that thing. I'm a bad person. I'm a bad kid. This is what I do. And I, yeah, I mean, I wish I would have learned that a long time ago because I'm certainly guilty of of the same thing in my own life with with my interactions with people. You know, I wonder why God ever let us be parents to begin with. (laughs) (laughs) Amen to that. (laughs) You know what? Especially you get that first child, you're really practicing on them. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, and that was kind of Keese's brainchild with this podcast. And I was like, man, that makes a lot of sense because Keese and I have put a lot of 
time and effort into our own children, but even more so that's kind of, as you know, it evolved into interacting with thousands of kids in the Valley and, and, and even beyond the Valley, yeah. because there's people in other places that are using, you know, our kids program to run their, their jujitsu schools. And it's important, I think, to have these kind of conversations, one, to let people know that we're all fallible and that nobody's mm -hmm. perfect. Got, yeah. Mm -hmm. And nobody's got it figured out, but maybe people listen to other people's mistakes and then they forgive themselves a little bit and go, okay, I messed up, but that's not who I'm as a parent. I'm not a bad parent. No, I can let that, mm -hmm. that bad moment go and then move forward and, and do better the next time. And, uh, so K Kisa's thought was, you know, we could have people on here we could talk about what it was like, what our experiences were, where we messed up, where we did something right, and then maybe save somebody the heartache or, you know, 20 years of making the mistake before you finally realize, oh, mm -hmm. now I see what I was doing. I can let go of that and move, move forward. And, you know, ultimately maybe that has an impact that is far reaching with other children who then become parents and, and then their children and, and so on. And hopefully we keep moving the bar up. Mm -hmm. So. So just to shift gears a little bit, in addition to being the head chef of the family and the spiritual leader of the family, you're also the game master of the family or the card shark. <laughs> well. Just because I beat you? <laughs> yes, because you beat me <laughs> repeatedly. Well, she beat us both Thursday night, but she did feed us enchiladas, so it wasn't a total loss. No, and ginger snaps, my favorite. Um, I, and I know you and I have talked about this, that you and Papa played cards long before you became the card shark of the family. But I don't remember hearing a lot about cards with the kids, with your kids. I mean, you were busy, you we, were going to school. We played poker. Okay, with, with the, the children? Kids? With the kids. For money? No. Oh. We had, I don't even know where it came from, but we had one of those things that held all the poker chips, mm -hmm. and we played poker with the chips. Who's and we played some board games like Monopoly, which I hate because so I played it so much. <laughs> so boring. <laughs> so I actually, long. I actually still really enjoy Monopoly. It's too much like real life. What? And so when did the canasta, when I came into the family 23 years ago, canasta was, if you didn't know how to play canasta or dominoes, I mean, just go sit outside. <laughs> Yeah, you would not be part of this family if you didn't know Canasta. No. Mm -mm. I, I had to learn Canasta fast, and I did not learn Canasta fast. It took me many years. <laughs> I learned Canasta from a friend of my mother's, and Papa and I went over, had dinner with them, and then they taught us how to play Canasta. And at that time, I only had Linda. In fact, I probably was pregnant with Sue because that happened pretty quick but um, that was always a fun thing and uh, and then it kind of lay dormant for years because we got into the pinochle mm. my dad and mom were great pinochle players and I think people during the depression they didn't have money to go out and do anything or pay a babysitter so there was a lot of card games mm -hmm. and usually it was pinochle hmm. which is now my favorite game it's so fun i think it's a great game to keep your mind active because it you know if you play it and really think about what the bid is and what the how many trump are out there you can really stretch your mind a lot and you do trav I do. I know you're such a card counter. That we should get it on record who your favorite pinochle partner is. Oh, uh, let's see. <laughs> that would be you, Trav. <laughs> oh, good. Good. <laughs> they are a force to be reckoned with. I always win when we're partners, and I tend to lose when we're not partners. So I think that you might have something to do with that. Could be. Nana's always slightly disappointed when you're not there to be 
her partner. Yeah. <laughs> she has to be partners. Or you're with. there and we don't have a fourth. So yeah. right. Like Thursday. Yes. Yeah, I know. And no, see, I then you are really. <laughs> <laughs> you actually, you had the, you came in last place on Thursday. Let's, uh, yeah, I went set. Yeah, you did go set. What's remarkable about, I think, first of all, I'm a, I, we played cards growing up, but it wasn't a thing the way it is in our family now. And what I appreciate as a parent playing cards is that all four of our kids, have learned to play these games over the years. And Debbie has, oh my gosh, she's taught my kids how to be competitive. Not that they needed any help learning how to be competitive. No, but competitiveness is good. It's very good, I think. You, you know, to have a goal that you're striving for and to figure out a strategy to, to reach your goal. And then, you know, there's an element of art in the trash talking that happens around the card table too. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember a game that she taught the kids when they were young, uh, baseball. Well, you taught yes. that to all of us. That was such a fabulous card game for the kids learning math. And they were learning it probably grade school to early middle school. And it was so good for Ted, too, who, you know, sequencing is a challenge for him and simple math problems are a mm -hmm. challenge for him. Um, Even Pinnacle has been great for Ted. I mean, as far as learning, you know, because with with not having his prefrontal cortex, one of the the main effects of that is impulse control, right? I mean, he's a spender. And we started to control him. Yes, yes. but you remember when he started, I he mean, was, he, he was would, he was going to bid up. I mean, he he refused to not win the bid. Yeah. He had no impulse control. <laughs> and now when you play with him, he's actually more deliberate and he actually mm -hmm. slows himself down and he actually plays quite well sometimes. Well, he beats us. Yeah. <laughs> and the same with poker. We, uh, you know, uh, the cousins and, and, and my brother and everybody came to town to visit you last week. And uh, my dad came over and, and my boys, Ricky and, and Ted, our boys. And Joe. Uh, Joe didn't play with us that night. Oh. But we played poker. And poker's another one where if you lack impulse control... It's not a fun game. Like you're gonna lose all your chips right away and you're done. And Ted sat there and played right up till the end. And I don't know that he would develop some of those uh, impulse control skills if it wasn't for those games. So it's kind of a, a safe way mm -hmm. to learn skills that become very helpful in life, yeah. math skills. And the fact that it's I mean, there's never a family get together where we're not playing cards. It's more like, oh, we're gonna have dinner at five. Okay, we'll come over at four so we can play cards before. And then let's hur let's hurry up and clear the dishes so we can play again. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing about that too, I think that is missing. And and correct me if I'm wrong, because I've only had 46 years on this earth. But it sure seems like there's a lot of families when you go to visit their home or you go over like on a holiday or a weekend and the television's just on incessantly and there's people just scattered around the house and there's people on their phones and they're scrolling through their news feeds and it's just very physically we're in the same space but mentally emotionally we're really whether we were there or sitting in our car or at our own home wouldn't be much different. And with card games and board games, mm -hmm. everybody's at a table together. And and there's talking that happens amongst the game that mm -hmm. doesn't have to do with the game. And there's just this connection. Does that, does that oh, ring true? Oh, ab absolutely. <laughs> and we do have a rule. No cell phones. Yeah. That's at, true. At the 100%. card game. Yeah, that's and Davison. every card game, some more than others, but every card game teaches things. Mm -hmm. Math, number one. And, you know, kids today have calculators, and uh, a lot of them don't even have simple math skills. Sequencing. But playing, playing cards, you do. Sequencing and organizing, how you're mm -hmm. organizing your cards in your hand. We just discovered that recently. We were teaching somebody, Pinnacle, and you and I organize our cards completely differently in our hands. You do it wrong. You do it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the other thing too, and, and this is true of, of just 
competition in general, whether it be a board game or a card game or a soccer game or a jujitsu match, you're also just learning how to win and lose. Mm -hmm. You're also learning, you know, and I think that's a skill lost on kids today. I mean, Keith and I see that in the gym a lot with, especially with old, only children, only, is that the right way to say that? Only, only chill, childs, only child, <laughs> whatever. Um, where these kids don't even understand that they're not going to win every time. And I watch kids over a period of like six months go from losing in a game and just throwing a huge fit and making a thousand excuses for why they got out mm-hmm. to eventually getting to the point where they give me a high five on their way over to the wall when they get out of the game. Like that, I think that's a, a an important life lesson about getting knocked down, but hey, you know, get back up, move forward, you know, and not letting those little hiccups in the road become, you know, a, a devastating experience. Yeah, because that's the reality of life. Mm-hmm. And don't we often learn more through the things that we fail at? I think every time. Yeah, mm-hmm. if we're willing to get up and try harder. Yep. Mm-hmm. I think I think that's true. I mean, you and I don't know what that's like because we win all the time. <laughs> but you and I are learning. I know. We're learning humility, <laughs> and I think that's an important skill that you and I have both gained from Pinochle. It has. I mean, I'm a lot more humble, if I do say so myself, than I used to be. Your nostrils are flaring. We know you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I was thinking of too, as we've had Pinochle games. How often? Do we bring another generation Mm -hmm. into it? You know, my dad's been dead for, I don't know, 45 years, I think. And um, we talk about him more when we're playing Pinochle. It's true. (laughs) I can eat cardboard and shit better cards than these. (laughs) Right? I mean, I think everybody in the family uses that line. Well, everybody knows Nana's line that she said to me. Remember, Kisa, God hates a coward. That's my favorite. <laughs> but according to Nana, that is in the Bible. <laughs> yeah. So I don't question it. There's, She's a very popular woman. Oh, damn, why didn't I throw that phone That's, out? Because now everybody knows how popular you are. Yep. Your phone rings. I, look, I lived with her for a month. Her phone rings off the hook all day, is, every day. Is that day. why I'm tired? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I tell my mom, you don't have to answer it. I, I just wonder if it's Tammy, you know. They're going through all that with Steve's brother. Oh, right. Oh, I didn't I didn't hear about that. Yeah, he's not well right now. Oh, well, okay. they've moved him or moving him to hospice. Yeah. That oh. yeah. Cuz I haven't mentioned this podcast to Tammy. There were other mm, things on her other mind. Other issues, yeah. 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 So when do you get to stop being a parent then? This is a good segue. Never. Never. Do you talk to your, I know you talk to Jay probably once a week. At least, yeah. And I know you talk to Deb. Twice a day. (laughs) (laughs) Me too. Or more. (laughs) I talk to her at least once a day uh, or more. Do you talk to all the girls every day? I do. Well, once in a while, you know. A couple days go by. And has it always been like that? Pretty much, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, what you're putting into your kids now are the rewards you'll get. They'll drive you crazy calling you all the time. <laughs> but <laughs> but that's, that's a reward of what you put into them is what you're going to yeah. get out. I think Kisa drives them crazy calling them all the time. I do. They, I created a group text, and I named it My Homies, and... Immediately, I sent a couple. Of, this was like three years ago. I sent a couple messages to them about how much I love them, and Joe and Ricky both left the group. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> Apparently, they can. They love it though. They do. They do. Everybody loves to be loved and wanted and appreciated. And if if the only thing is that you pick up the phone and you've taken that two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes out of your day, they know that. Nana, mm-hmm. Nana decided to talk to me for two minutes instead of something else. Yeah. You know, one of the important things I think that we can instill in our kids is that there are consequences. 
they're either good or they're not good. And I think we've lost that in society. There are no consequences for the bad things people do. Mm-hmm. Talk about that a little bit. Well, <clears throat> I think with your kids, if you indulge them in their sin, really, because if if they're um, being disrespectful or they've done something that they know is wrong, and you don't make them face the fact, and I'm not talking about, you know, whipping them and doing all sorts of, but, you know, I've seen with a lot of people, some of them in this family that I will not mention, that have overindulged the kids, and they're getting rewarded for bad behavior. Mm-hmm. And what does that teach you? Bad behavior is okay. Right. Mm. So uh, maybe a lack of accountability. Exactly. In fact, I've got that word written down. Yeah, I think I would agree with you on that. I think that there is a a, a lack of accountability um, and also um, ownership. I think that, like we talked about earlier, we're all going to make mistakes and and yeah. and we're never going to stop. I mean, as long as we're alive, I think we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do things we regret. We're gonna do things that we wish we hadn't done. And I think what I see missing in not just the next generation, but even in my generation with you know my peer group, where there are so many times where if we would just own it and come back and say, you know what, man, I messed up. I'm really sorry. That's my fault. That was my fault. And and we just took responsibility for it. Mm. It would be so much easier to make less mistakes in the future and so much easier to move forward. But instead, there's this immediate um, knee-jerk reaction to start pointing our fingers in other places. Mm-hmm. Well, I wouldn't have done that <clears throat> if it wasn't for this. And, you know, you did that. And, and you know... If instead we just accepted our role in 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 those things, it, we could move on. And if we ask forgiveness, and if we and if we're truly sorry, and if we forgive ourselves, and then we you know forgive other people, it's it's so much easier to to kind of live the life that we want to live. But for for whatever reason, it, it's for me personally, that's one of the hardest things to do is to go to somebody and say, "Will you forgive me?" I messed up. How do you feel when you do that, though? I feel I feel great. Isn't that a great feeling? Mm-hmm. It's a it's it it's the only thing that ever gets rid of that rotten feeling, that heaviness mm-hmm. on your chest. Is not just saying it, not saying, "Hey, Nana, I'm really sorry that I was late today," or "Hey, Nana, I'm sorry that." Um, you know, I said I was going to come over and, and mow your lawn, and I didn't. You know, not just saying it, but really meaning it. Yeah. And and going to that person and with, with total sincerity saying, you know what? I am so sorry. I messed up. I made a bad decision. Will you forgive me? And then the, the reverse is true, too. <clears throat> when somebody comes to you with, with that, a sincere apology and being able to honestly look at them and say, you know what? I forgive you. Yeah. I forgive you. And to really to really forgive somebody and walk away from that situation and feel like you you started anew. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. I accept your apology. We're good. You messed up. I forgive you. I love you. And now let's start move on let's go play cards clean slate yeah (laughs) well i think that goes too back to the conversation you had with your sister and brother-in-law is it's i think it's really hard for kids to come forward and say i screwed up forgive me if what the message they're hearing from their parents is that they are bad instead of what they did was yeah was bad or back to the example that nana gave of grandma waltz where Mm -hmm. you know here you are Young child, you're going to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. You're going to spill something on the floor or you're going to not clean your room or, you know, whatever it is. And 
you come and say, you know, I'm really sorry. <laughs> Might be important. Can you reach it? Okay. I like that this is on camera. It should be. This yeah. is real life. Yeah, this is this is my life. Oh, it, it is, is Tammy. Tammy. Yeah, Tam. <laughs> what? We're doing a podcast. <laughs> You're on it right now. You're on it. <laughs> I'm doing a, po a podcast with Trav and Kisa on parenting. Oh, my gosh. Okay, I want to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, bye. Okay, did Steve get home? He did. Good. Okay, I'll talk, I'll talk later. Love you. <laughs> That was awesome. Oh, a missed call from Debbie, voicemail from Debbie, a voicemail from Joyce, Sarah. <laughs> Did you turn your ringer off? Oh, it really hurts to be popular. popular. So popular. You're needed. It's true. <laughs> but back to what I was saying, you know, if 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 a if a child makes a mistake and and then they ask mm -hmm. for forgiveness and and they apologize and and they mean it. Yep. And then you as the parent say, okay, it's okay. And then a, a, a few weeks go by and, and you leave your bike in the driveway. And then they're like, back to, and you remember you spilt all that stuff on the floor. And it's like, you what just is, can do no right. Yep. Yeah. Everything's then, wrong with you. I didn't spill things, I shot people. <laughs> <laughs> you shot people? <laughs> what did you shoot people with? My brother's BB gun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised. I'm actually not surprised. Who did you shoot with your brother's BB gun? My sister. <laughs> <laughs> A she, little thing. She probably deserved it. Uh, she did. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Should we should we um, start moving towards our our three our, questions? Our questions? Yes. Okay, so oh wait, Nana might still have things to oh, say. Oh no, <clears throat> she's got notes. Well, I just wrote down a few words that I thought were important, and you know when we start with with kids, you know the Bible says train them up. Well, the word train means discipline them, and that doesn't mean beating them or mm -hmm. demoralizing them, but uh, to discipline them is to reprove things that aren't right and correct them and teach them things that are. Hmm. Yep. Yeah. It was, we were, uh, this, I, I hate to compare kids to dogs, but. <laughs> I was thinking that myself. <laughs> people, people spend more time training their animals. <laughs> I think there's better books and there's schools to learn how to train your dogs and there's mm -hmm. people to train your dogs. And when it comes to kids, it's crickets. Yeah. And we were talking about kids and dogs, I think, actually do make a really good comparison because we got in public. You've been over to people's homes where their dogs are just awful. Yes. Right? And then you've been around people where their dogs are well behaved. And it's not the dog. It's never the dog. Like it's the owner. <laughs> correct. Always. Correct. And you can you see it immediately. And the problem with having a well-behaved dog is it requires a lot of time and effort. Mm -hmm. You have to spend every day with that dog when it's a puppy, and you have to correct it when it makes a mistake. And you have to. And this is, I think, people miss this. You have to praise it every time it does what you want it to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's missing sometimes is there's a whole lot of correction. Yes. But and not enough praise. Yes. Correct. And I think that's just a human flaw because I think we do that with our partners. We do it with our parents. We do it with our children. We do it with our friends. But to be clear, that word discipline has a kind of negative connotation. And what I hear both of you saying is that there's two sides of that coin. There's... You know what? I think one of the main things that we need to learn in life is balance. And whether it's training your children, your dog, or your just husband. your relation, yeah, <laughs> and, or your relationship with other people, there has to be a balance. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. 
I agree. So Keith and I have just kind of organically, uh, you know, we didn't have any sort of plan with this podcast other than to find people that we thought were interesting, people that we thought had something to contribute and get them on here to just talk with us. And then um, what kind of arose organically is we ended up ending every podcast with three questions. Um, And the first two are thinking back on parenting, thinking of a time where you just completely missed the mark, where you just blew it, because we all have, and asking, you know, give, give us an example of a time that you had a parenting fail. Like when you look back on all your years of parenting and, and the five children that you've raised, um, is there a moment that stands out in your mind of where, man, I today I blew it like where you go to bed thinking to yourself I really wish I would have handled that better to try to maybe help somebody else avoid that same pitfall well I I think the thing that comes to mind first is when I found out my oldest daughter was pregnant and I eventually eased into doing the right thing. Mm. But I think at first, I was not only angry with her, but um, the father of the child um, never liked him, always discerned that he was not good. And I think I allowed that to affect the way I treated my daughter at the original onset. Mm -hmm. I did come through that, but, um, you know, to realize that uh, loving someone, regardless of what has Mm -hmm. taken place, is still the major thing. Mm -hmm. That, that's helpful for Keese and I, because we're now, we now have children at an age where they're having relationships. Fortunately, we've been blessed so far um, because we've approved of the other people. But I've often wondered about that when you have a child who does choose somebody who you wouldn't choose for them. But it sounds like maybe continuing to love and support your child might actually be more effective in getting them to see Mm. that that other person maybe isn't the person for them. Mm. Is that? Well, I don't know if that would have happened in this situation. It was kind of after the fact. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, love is the greatest of all. Mm. Bible tells us that. But, you know, love has to come with wisdom and uh, I think of a, a scripture in First Corinthians 13, which is the love uh, chapter, that we rejoice in the truth and not in iniquity. Hmm. So we have to see something for what it is, but we still have to react <laughs> with a, a kindness and love yeah, it's easy to love when everything's going your way, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's that um, unconditional love, or maybe you could help me understand agape love. What 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 is what is the difference? Agape love is a divine <laughs> love, and we don't have that. We have filio, which is a fellowship, or or you know, but. Um, Agape love only comes through God. And as we get to know him better and we see how he responds to us with all of our stuff, that is, you know, a divine love forgives, as you were talking about, Mm -hmm. even when you don't feel like it, but because you know it's the right thing to do, yeah. Okay, so on a positive note, we also ask, what is a success 
Like when you High think point. when you think back of all of your parenting and all of your interactions, that one came to mind quickly for you as far as a, a thing that you m- would have probably done different in hindsight. But what was a time where you felt like, man, we really nailed it. Pop and I nailed it this time, or I nailed it this time. This was a parenting victory. This was something where, as a parent, I, I did my job. I think, you know, you have four children. Mm-hmm. I have five. And I think all of them are different. And we all probably could point to one child and say, that child took a lot more of my time and energy. (laughs) (laughs) And and I don't mean illness and things, you know. It's just personality. And uh, I think one of the greatest achievements was when, you know, I went through some pretty tough early teenage years with one of them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, And then to see her come through with flying colors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is probably one of the greatest Mm. achievements. Um, I don't know if it's our success or combination of things, but... um, Yeah. And that's not... That sounds like it's not just one... That wasn't just one day, but that was tenacity and perseverance. Years. Staying the course and... Parenting mm-hmm. with love. Yeah. Mm. Did you ever want to give up? No, I wanted to kill her. <laughs> <laughs> Where was that BB I, gun when you BB needed? <laughs> <laughs> Give me the BB gun. Well, you want to finish with the, the yeah. last question because I think the last question is the most important. I do too. So the last question is one piece of advice, golden nugget, like. Oh, gosh, that's that is a big one. And Mm -hmm. it is important. But I think acceptance Mm. of who your kids are, and who they're going to become. Mm. Because, you know, you go through rough spots with some of them, or at least I did. But, you know, before I ever grew up and got married, I remember thinking, that was one thing that I wanted more than anything else. I wanted to be married and have children. Mm. The other one was to go into nursing, mm. which didn't happen early on, but later. But I think the greatest achievement that we have is when we can raise our kids and they're good citizens, they've... Uh, accomplish something in their lives Mm -hmm. but um, seeing them through it so and not not learning each one's learning who they are who they are so not necessarily and allowing them to be who they are right that is a golden nugget you know that's that's come up before so it obviously Mm -hmm. you know it's it's important and I I know I've thought about it oftentimes because, as you know, our kids were kind of all four of them were in the gym, and and you have expectations of them, and it, and and it's really easy, I think, sometimes to view your children as an extension, correct, mm-hmm. a smaller version of you, and then at some point you have to realize that they are their own. Per- like I, I was a you know a child, and I'm somebody's child, but I'm not them. Mm-hmm. And my kids aren't me, mm-hmm. and l- allowing them to be who they are, accepting them for yeah. who they are, mm-hmm. and loving them unconditionally. Right. Mm-hmm. I think that's a that's a solid tip. But it, I think if early on you can kind of recognize the fact that they are different, mm-hmm. they're unique. There's not two of us that have the same DNA or mm-hmm. thumbprint or anything. And, um, you know, just to be open to looking at their lives and seeing where their bent is. Mm -hmm. That's That's good advice. That's perfect. Thanks, Nana. You are so welcome. Thank you, guys. (laughs) Love you, Nan. Love Love you. you.
<laughs> Love you more. <laughs> <laughs> Competitive. Yeah. See, that was easy. Yeah, it was, that was fun. Wasn't that fun? <laughs> we'll have to have Nana as a repeat guest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, what do you have planned today? Well, I'm going to go out to the store at some point and um, just kind of catching up on some loose ends I cleaned yesterday, but I have a few things that I didn't quite get to. So. Return all your phone calls? I uh, yeah. Don't forget to turn your ringer on, or you're gonna have a thousand voicemails. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? There are so many interruptions in our day, but you know what? If we can accept them as just something good, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes when I'm trying to study or do something, and I got phone call, phone call, phone call, and I used to complain. And now I turn it into a Thanksgiving, and I just say, thank you, Lord, that there are people that still want to talk to me. (laughs) I know. I used to think that all the time. Like, can I just go pee without some little child popping their head in? Can I just take a bath? And now I miss it. Yeah. Of course, I have the four-legged toddlers who are always (laughs) underfoot. On our lap. Yeah. Yeah. They follow me around. But you know what? You guys have done a super job. You really have. The evidence is in your kids. And some of the um, attributes in your kids' lives, to me, are the most important. Mm -hmm. I see compassion. I see kindness. Mm -hmm. I see consideration. I see politeness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so many kids, those things are lacking. And it's to their own detriment. Yeah. Because, you know, when people overindulge your kids and they don't raise them to have good quality attributes, people don't care for them. Uh, my mom once said that all of the world's wars were caused by bad manners. And I think that's so true. Well, you know what? We were taught to respect elders. Mm hmm. And, you know, I go out, I go out to the store, I go somewhere, and especially a place like Walmart or Costco where people are. And you know what I see? I mean, I'm obviously an elderly woman. (laughs) (laughs) And when people are walking towards you, and they're younger, they're your age or younger even, and they'd never step out of their way. You have to step out of their way. Mm. And yeah. I'm thinking, what happened? How did that happen? That's an interesting yeah. observation. It drives me nuts too, like when I go to a restaurant, like we're at Sykes or something. And I, even as a child, I would do this, or if I was on the bus or something. And it doesn't even have to be an elderly person, but maybe a woman gets on the bus and you give your seat up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I come to these restaurants sometimes and I'll see like three or four teenagers on their phone oblivious to what's going on around them taking up all the seating and then to see somebody in their 70s or 80s standing Mm -hmm. and it's like what is wrong with these? do you ever say anything to those kids i'm going to start i probably should start because it drives me crazy you know you should because chances are they they don't even know they don't know they don't know and what a great thing to be i mean if i was that teenager and i'm oblivious and those red bearded bald guy comes up to me and says, Hey, why don't you why don't you hop up so these folks can have a seat? I would I would jump at that opportunity because who doesn't want to feel like they've done something good for yeah. someone else? Or opening a door. I mean I've I offer uh, you know, if you were at the grocery store and I was getting out of my car and you're unloading your groceries and putting them in your trunk, I would offer to help. Great. I'd love to have that <laughs> But you know, what, what are you doing later like, today? I mean, I mean, I think that that <clears throat> that is missing, mm-hmm. and I think that we would be so better off as a society if, instead of just walking past somebody, yeah. if we just stop and say, "Hey, can I help you put your groceries in your car?" Yeah, and you know, I don't know if this is still true, but I know when Joe and I traveled, um, I have a nephew in Nashville, and we'd go there, you know, every couple of years or so. And we'd always come away saying, oh, my gosh, such good manners these people have. Mm. In oh, the in South. the South. Yeah. yeah. yeah that, that may have changed. It's been a while since oh, I've been pretty, there. It's, it's 
Yeah, and but, even if, <clears throat> I mean, even if their hearts don't, aren't congruent with their words and actions, at least their words and actions are courteous. That well, southern you know, well, it has to start somewhere. Yeah. The thing I was told about New York City, how rude people are there. They are. I A lot of them are, but you know what? When I went this, I think it was the first time I went with Dana, and we rode the subway just so we mm-hmm. could say we rode the subway. <laughs> and we got on, and it was pretty crowded, and a black man, probably as old as I, got up and gave me his seat. And I'm going... Wow, that was so great. That's something I still think about. Mm. And that took place about 16 years ago. Hmm. We remember Mm -hmm. things. Yeah. And if we could remind ourselves, too, that it's so easy to have such a big impact. Mm. Like, how hard is it for me to give up a seat in a, you know, a restaurant waiting area? Yeah. Yeah. It is no effort. It's no inconvenience. But the impact is huge. I had a a real dark, dark period. You look so cute today. You're probably going to photograph quite well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I had a really dark period when we moved here where I was just so lonely and and everything was hard, right? Everything was hard. And I used to, my kind of alone meditation time, uh, I'd get the kids to bed and I'd tell Trav, I really have to go to the grocery store. I've got, I have to get these things. And really what I would do is just walk up and down the aisles of the grocery store and collect myself. But I would always try to end every one of those trips by striking up a friendly conversation with the checker or complimenting somebody. On, I, I had to do, felt like I had to end that trip doing something or saying something nice to someone and for it to be genuine. And then it just fed my soul at that time. You know, we had a checker in Squim. Mm-hmm. That, and I I got to where I avoided going through her check stand because she was such a grumpy sourpuss. <laughs> and the Lord really checked me on it and said, Do you know what? She's probably having a hard time. Mm. And I remember the day I made the, the decision I was going to go through her check stand, and her name was Bernice. And I said, hi, Bernice, how are you doing today? And her face kind of lit up a little bit. And after that, I always tried to go through her check stand and say something. Who knows what's going on yeah. at home? Who knows? That, I feel like that's compassion. That is compassion in action. Well, I really didn't like her too much to begin <laughs> with because... <laughs> Papa and I went through her check stand one time, and he had his hat on, and it was trying to think who was running for election, what Republican. (laughs) And they had ice cream, two half gallons, for a certain price. So he had his two half gallons of ice cream, and Bernice said to him, real kind of snarly, like, I like your choice of ice cream, but I don't like your politics. (laughs) (laughs) I could well, just see. gee, there's something we can agree on. <laughs> <laughs> I could just see Papa's face, too. <laughs> he was always nice. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Was. Okay, we better get you home. Thanks for joining us today. If you want more information about the Growing Gorillas Martial Arts Program for kids, please visit growinggorillas.com. And if you're interested in finding an SBG near you in the state of Montana, please visit us at sbgmontana.com. See you soon. Stay cold, Pony Boy. Peace out, Girl Scout. Catch you on the flip-flop. Catch you on the flipper, dipper. After a while, crocodile. I don't know anymore. (laughs) See you later, alligator. (laughs) Bye.